Not until we've taken a look into the future shall we be strong and bold enough to investigate our past honestly and impartially. Eric Von Daniken Four and a half million to two million years ago, Australopithecus, the first being resembling a human, lived in Africa. Two million years ago, Homo erectus came into being. 200,000 years ago, Neanderthal human, the caveman, came into being. Although more than two million years had passed between the advanced Australopithecus and Neanderthal, the sharp-edged flakes of stones, which were used as tools by both groups, are almost identical to the appearances of these groups and can hardly be distinguished. In other words, although such a long period of time had passed, there were no developments. Then some 40,000 years ago, the Neanderthal human breed became extinct. And if the Neanderthal breed became extinct, the prioritized subject of wonder is, who are the ancestors of the Homo sapiens? As the research goes on, it gets discovered that modern humans named Cro-Magnon, who resemble to us quite a lot, came into existence almost out of the blue some 50,000 years ago, and they coexisted and lived together with the Neanderthal for 10,000 years. The mystery around the Cro-Magnon humans coming into existence increases even more with further discoveries because Cro-Magnon has evolved from an early Homo sapien who lived in Africa about 250,000 years ago. According to Professor Theodosis Dobzhansky, who is an authority on the matter, the modern humans may have relatives who are from the same line of race in terms of fossils, but they do not have ancestors. Civilization has started in Africa, but the question that is yet to be answered is this. Why did civilization come into existence? Based on all data, in fact, the humans should have been still lacking civilization. When it comes to this issue, many admit we should not have even the civilization in the first place. In other words, there is no apparent reason why we are not at the developmental stage of the Amazonian tribes or the like. The problem is not in their lag, but rather our progress. Two million years had passed between the times when humans started cutting stones naturally and the times when they started cutting and shaping these stones pursuant to the purposes. Why did not another two million years pass to learn to use other tools? How come astronauts landed on the moon 40,000 years after the Neanderthal humans became extinct? It is exactly at this point where science comes to a deadlock that is being suggested through the ancient astronauts theory that the Homo erectus had an extraterrestrial intervention around 250 to 300,000 BC and that the Homo sapien was created by tampering with the genes of the primates, utilizing a method similar to in vitro fertilization. Although we do not know who made this come true, according to Sumerians, these were Anunnaki. In order to understand this story better, we have to go back about 50,000 years when something strange was happening, seemingly out of nowhere. The Cro-Magnon species appears. Who were Cro-Magnons? Cro-Magnon is the name scientists once used to refer to what are now called early modern humans or anatomically modern humans, people who lived in our world at the end of the last ice age. But what is interesting to our story is that the Cro-Magnon suddenly uses not only stones, but also wood and bones, lives in organized groups, uses animal skins for clothing and protection, and leaves traces and records of life in the form of cave paintings buries the dead members of the community 
It also possesses the ability to speak. What is particularly strange is that it turns out that this extremely rapid development occurred during the Ice Age, a time period that is least conductive to development. Basically, it all comes down to the familiar missing link. Although the sudden appearance of Cro-Magnon and Homo sapiens is a true mystery, the Middle East is where the first signs of significant development of civilization appear. The first traces of agriculture and animal husbandry were discovered in this location. In 11,000 BC, the Paleolithic period ceases and the Mesolithic era begins. This period is recognizable because it is when the man becomes a farmer. That is the human domestication of flora and fauna occurs. Then the Neolithic age follows. It is believed that humans developed a lot in the period between 7500 and 5000 BC. However, around 4500 BC, we have a mysterious collapse of civilization that some scientists attribute to climate change, and then a sudden explosion of civilization once again. Sumer and Mesopotamia still fascinate historians and scientists even today. The Sumerians were ahead in terms of advancement in many ways. They had pictographic symbols that were imprinted on clay. Many documents show how prices were calculated. The mathematical system was based on the number 60, not 10 as it is today, making it the first mathematical system ever. Court certificates were issued on clay. There were signs of trade, use of brick and several other construction innovations as well as traces of the use of bitumen and asphalt in construction, medicine, agriculture, a legal system in place, horoscopes, astronomy, temples, religion, and so forth. After the Stone Age, two million years ago, the Sumer era is when humans experienced one of the greatest shifts in development around 3800 BC. And what is it that causes sudden shifts and peaks in the development of civilization? The Sumerians had thousands of clay tablets, cuneiforms, which according to them, hold the answer to this question. It was the Sumerian gods. In these gods who form the backbone of the story of the development of civilization, according to the records of the ancient Sumerians, that is the narration of the gods themselves. The supreme god was An or Anu according to the Babylonian and Assyrian texts. The second strongest was Enlil and the third was Enlil's brother named Enki. Enki had the role of a leading scientist and according to the records, he was the one who created the model of a man mentioned in the texts as Adipa, from where some draw a parallel with the Christian version of the first man, Adam. The records speak of their hierarchy, the way in which the throne was inherited, intrigues known from the lives of the people themselves, descriptions of weapons that eject balls of light, their bases, paths to heaven or space in celestial chariots and winged objects, and much more. In ancient records, these extraterrestrials are called Nephilim, and in other ancient texts, they are also referred to as the Anunnaki. The Sumerians claimed that our solar system consisted of the sun and 11 planets, including the moon. Mathematically speaking, one planet is missing, the 12th planet. What is interesting is that they also had descriptions of the constellations of the northern sky. Scientists still have no answer as to how it was possible to do this without precise tools and instruments. A cuneiform describing this statement can be found in the Berlin Museum under the designation VAT.7847, document AO.6478 describes 26 stars in the sky in the area of Cancer constellation and expresses their distance in three different units of measurement. Who had the need for this information and how was it calculated this precisely at the time? The Sumerians claim that this knowledge was actually passed on to them from the visitors. 
This is when we come to a very interesting analysis of the Acadian cylinder VA-243. The Acadian cylinder seal that can be found at the State Museum in East Berlin, cataloged under VA-243, dates from the 3rd millennium BC, and it's at least 4,500 years old. It's one of the most ancient cylinder seals that have been found. It shows the god Enlil granting the plow, the knowledge of agriculture to humankind. What is particularly interesting on this seal is what is said to be a depiction of our solar system in the top left. You can see 11 globes surrounding what appears to be the sun. Author Zakaria Sitchin spent a number of pages in his book, The Twelfth Planet, discussing and analyzing this depiction. Sitchin contends that this depiction shows our solar system with the various heavenly bodies and their relative sizes. We can see the nine planets we know of today, assuming Pluto is also a planet. The moon, ancient civilizations also held our moon to be a planet, the sun, and a tenth planet that we have yet to locate. Critics disagree with Sitchin. Ancient language scholar Michael S. Heiser, for example, writes that the symbol looking like the sun in the middle isn't the sun at all, but a star. The globes surrounding it are also stars according to Heiser. He also says there's no evidence that points to the fact that the Sumerians knew about more than five planets in our solar system. The obvious question that comes to mind is, if the objects depicted are all stars, then why is the one in the middle depicted differently with rays coming out of it? Not only that, but why are the globes surrounding it depicted in different sizes? Is that just by chance, or was it done on purpose to show the relative sizes of the planets like Sitchin argues in his book? Research has been conducted to compare the relative sizes of the globes depicted on the cylinder seal with the size of the planets in our solar system to see if they are matched, and it appears they do and that they were indeed drawn to scale. Not only that, but based on this knowledge, we can gain some insights about the 10th planet in our solar system, often referred to as Planet X or according to Sitchin called Nibiru, an astronomical body mentioned in Mesopotamian texts. Can it be just mere coincidence that the relative sizes of all the 12 globes on cylinder seal VA-243 happen to closely match with the relative sizes of the heavenly bodies in our solar system on a logarithmic scale? Can it be just mere coincidence that the diameters of the globes on the cylinder seal happen to be chosen so perfectly relative to each other and to scale, to so closely match the dimensions in reality? Or must we conclude that the artist who drew the globes most likely made a conscious decision to draw them in their relative sizes based on the knowledge he had? What are the odds that this could happen just by chance? That the artist just randomly placed 12 globes on the cylinder seal that just happened to be almost precisely to scale compared to our solar system? Apparently, the Sumerians knew how to use some form of logarithmic scaling to be able to depict the planets in their relative sizes close to being accurate. Rather than linearly scaling the solar system down to a smaller size in the drawing, which would have made certain planets so small in relation to the sun that they'd be hard to see, they did it logarithmically. A clever solution. It's a smaller scale fractal representation of the whole. And we do in fact live in a fractal universe, after all, as the ancients were well aware of. The question that needs to be asked is how could they know all of this? If they didn't develop all this knowledge themselves, where did they get it from? Could they really have gotten it from the Anunnaki gods like they claim in their writings? Even on seal VA-243, we can see the Anunnaki god Enlil granting the knowledge of agriculture to humans. In the same way they could have gotten other knowledge as well, including that of our solar system. If the Sumerian depiction of our solar system is accurate, then what else is? Could it be that everything they wrote about is accurate and based on scientific and historical fact? Certainly Sitchin, who spent most of his life researching this, thought so. According to Sitchin and the interpretations of the other scholars, the Sumer formed our planet's earliest known civilization in the historical region of southern Mesopotamia, now southern Iraq. 
Their society emerged during the Chalolithic and early Bronze Ages between the 6th and 5th millennium BC, living along the valleys of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Sumerian farmers grew an abundance of grain and other crops, the surplus from which enabled them to form urban settlements. Their earliest texts are believed to date between 3500 and 3000 BC and come from the excavated remains of the cities of Uruk and Jimdid Nasir in central Iraq. The people worshipped a set of giant deities known as the Anunnaki. In their earliest texts, these gods are the most powerful and important in the Sumerian pantheon, the descendants of the sky god Anu. They were thought to possess extraordinary powers and were of tremendous physical size. They were frequently depicted wearing horned caps consisting of up to seven superimposed pairs of ox horns and were also sometimes adorned with elaborate decorative gold and silver ornaments. Although certain deities are described as members of the Anunnaki, no complete list of names has survived. But scholars identify a group of seven gods who decree that include Anu, Enlil, Enki, Ninhursag, Nana, Utu, and Inanna. Now, according to Sitchin's interpretation of Mesopotamian iconography and symbolism outlined in his 1976 book, The Twelfth Planet, and its sequels, there is an undiscovered planet beyond Neptune that follows a long elliptical orbit reaching the inner solar system roughly every 3600 years that is home to the Anunnaki, a race of extraterrestrials whose arrival on Earth dates back much further than the dawn of ancient Sumerian civilization. Sitchin and many other researchers believe the Anunnaki first arrived on this planet some 440,000 years ago to mine gold, a crucial resource to repair their planet's atmosphere following nuclear war. Their home planet called Nibiru is set apart from other known planets in our solar system in that it is believed to orbit the sun in the opposite direction. According to the definitions of most theorists, Nibiru is a red or brown dwarf star that carries along with its seven planets orbiting around each other, making it a mini solar system in its own right. Approximately five times the size of Jupiter, it would make 6,500 times larger than Earth. As the story goes, the Anunnaki, led by Anu's son Inki, arrived in the Persian Gulf 440,000 years ago and established Eridu, Earth Station 1, for the extraction of gold. About 415,000 BC, gold mining in the region waned and production switched to South Africa, where vast deposits had been identified west of the port of Maputo. At about this time in their history, Anu arrived on Earth with his heir apparent Enlil, who took command of the Earth mission, with Inki packed off to supervise the mining. By 400,000 BC, seven functional settlements existed in southern Mesopotamia, including a spaceport or Sippar, mission control center in Nippur, and a metallurgical center in Shurapak. Ore arrived by ships from Africa, and the refined metal was delivered to orbiters manned by Ijiji, lesser gods, and then transferred to spaceships arriving periodically from Nibiru. In 2005, archaeologists discovered the remains of a vast metropolis about 150 kilometers west of Maputo that measures, according to initial surveys, a staggering 1,500 square kilometers. But this ancient city is, according to many researchers, part of an even bigger complex that covers an area of 10,000 square kilometers. According to Sitchin, 
The first Anunnaki extraterrestrial to arrive on Earth was their former ruler, Alalu, who fled his home planet and found refuge here. He first discovered the existence of gold and the information got back to Anu. About 380,000 BC, Alalu's grandson attempted to seize power on Earth with the help of Ijiji, who worked the mines for the Anunnaki. But Enlil's forces prevailed in the War of the Olden Gods and retained control of gold production. By now, it must be obvious that these extraterrestrials appear to have far greater lifespans than we do today, seemingly living for tens of thousands of years or longer. The next important date in their involvement on the Earth happened about 300,000 BC when the Ijiji working in the gold mines mutinied. The revolt was put down by Inki and his partner Ninhirsag, the party's chief medical officer who replaced the Ijiji with a race of genetically engineered primitive workers descended from an ape woman. Rivalry between Inki and Enlil was strong and the latter raided the mines of South Africa, taking slave workers to Eden in Mesopotamia, a center for clay excavation. Not originally engineered to procreate, increased demand for workers resulted in further engineering to produce offspring and Homo sapiens began to multiply. From 200,000 BC, the Earth faced a new glacial period and it was not until 100,000 BC that the climate warmed again when to Enlil's growing annoyance, the Anunnaki had started breeding with mankind. About 75,000 BC, a new ice age began with regressive forms of mankind roaming the Earth. One of the period's survivors was Cro-Magnon Man. The next stage in mankind's development came around 50,000 BC when Inki and Ninhursag elevated humans of Anunnaki parentage to rule in Shuropak. This is said to have enraged Enlil, who began to plot mankind's demise around 13,000 BC. He was aware Nibiru's proximity to Earth would trigger an immense tsunami in about 11,000 BC, which he made the Anunnaki swear to keep secret from mankind. But according to the legends, Inki broke this oath and instructed Noah, possibly an Anunnaki human hybrid, to build a craft to survive the deluge, which the Anunnaki witnessed from their orbiting spacecraft. In the aftermath, Enlil agreed to grant what was left of mankind implements and seeds to begin agriculture in the highlands, with Inki domesticating livestock saved from the flood. By 10,500 BC, the descendants of Noah were allotted three regions, with Ninurta, Enlil's foremost son, damming the mountains and draining the rivers to make Mesopotamia habitable. Inki reclaimed the Nile Valley, while the Sinai Peninsula was retained by the Anunnaki for a spaceport and a control center established on Mount Moriah, the future Jerusalem. From this period on, the dates become a bit more exact and in 9780 BC, Marduk aka Ra, Inki's firstborn son, divided dominion over Egypt between Osiris and Seth before Seth dismembered Osiris in 9330 BC to seize control of the Nile Valley. Bitter fighting between dynasties is then believed to have resulted in two pyramid wars before peace was negotiated by Ninhursag, a half-sister to Enki and Enlil. By 7400 BC, with peace still prevailing, the Anunnaki granted mankind further advances and the Neolithic period began with demigods ruling over Egypt. Around 3800 BC, 
Urban civilization began in Sumer as the Anunnaki re-established the olden cities beginning with Eridu and Nippur. Anu returned to Earth for a ceremonial visit and a new city, Uruk, was built in his honor, his temple becoming the abode of his beloved granddaughter, Inanna. In 3760 BC, the mankind was, for the first time, given the opportunity to rule and govern independently. Kish was the first city of such kind. Then begins the calendar of Nippur, as well as the rapid development of civilization. But peace in the region was short-lived in 2024 BC. Leading his followers, Marduk marches towards Sumer and sets himself on the throne of Babylon. The struggle starts spreading to central Mesopotamia. Enlil demands for Marduk and Nebu to be punished. Enki objects, but his son Nergal moves to Enlil's side. As Nebu sent his Canaanite followers to the Sinai space station, the Anunnaki allow the use of what appears to be a nuclear weapon. Two of Enlil's attacks against the Inki clan and humanity are described in the stories of the Deluge and the Tower of Babel. In his final attempt, after coercing the assembly of the gods into voting yes, was the nuclear bombing of five cities, including Sodom and Gomorrah, which resulted in the destruction of the Sumerian civilization and the Anunnaki's own civilization on Earth, including their spaceport in the Sinai. To make a parallel with the ancient nuclear war, it's interesting that radioactive human remains found in two ancient Indian Pakistani cities, the two cities are Harappa and Mohenjo Daro. Strange as this sounds, but the radioactive level of dozens of bodies and melting, fusing and crystallizing of bricks and surrounding materials actually indicate a nuclear bomb or some kind of blast explosion. Today, scientists know of no other ways this damage could have been caused by other than a nuclear weapon. Some 2,000 years before the story of Jesus began, the Anunnaki unleashed nuclear weapons to bring an end to conflict with winds carrying radioactive clouds to Sumer. People died terrible deaths, animals perished, and the water was poisoned. The soil became barren and the great Sumerian civilization died. But that wasn't the end of the story. Sitchin suggests there were two separate Anunnaki departures from Earth. The first, involving mainly the Enlites, came immediately after their defeat by Ra in the Second Pyramid War, about 8670 BC. The second more comprehensive departure occurred after the fall of Babylon in about 539 BC. Following the destruction of their Sinai spaceport facility in the Second Pyramid War, Sitchin suggests remaining facilities in Mesoamerica, in particular Nazca and Teotihuacan, were used by the Anunnaki to depart first for Mars and then Nibiru. The question left for mankind is, will they return? Perhaps it's time we start paying more attention to all these ancient writings in order to see what we can learn from them. Scientists, in all their arrogance, have continued to downplay the significance of these ancient writings, often dismissing them as myths. But as others, such as Sitchin, have pointed out, the ancients didn't waste so much of their time writing hundreds of clay tablets and making cylinder seals just to write down fantasy stories. They were recording history and preserving knowledge for future generations. We like to think that we're the height of human civilization, that we know it all, and that ancient civilizations were primitive and believed in made-up gods. But a lot of the knowledge and technology we think is new today is just being rediscovered and reinvented this fact will continue to become more apparent in the future.
Thank you for watching and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video. We really hope you subscribe and if you'd like to be notified of future releases, just hit the bell button. Leave a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are on all of this and what topics you'd like to explore in our future videos.